other states. We're not talking about medical, we're just talking about recreational cannabis. Um, I was just gonna jump in on that end. Um, Pennsylvania, for example, Pennsylvania has a pretty expansive medical use program, but you can get in trouble if you have marijuana on you, even if you're an approved user, if you don't have your certification card. Uh, so it's, it's that tightly restricted. And of course, a reminder that marijuana is still illegal in Pennsylvania. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, so when we talk about the but, impact, but, yeah. What about CBD? CBD oil? Is that totally separate? Is that lumped in there with it? What's what, what's the problem? I I totally think so. So <laughs> CBD oil is a very interesting uh, thing on its own. Uh, because CBD on its own doesn't necessarily have any THC in it, and when we're talking about uh, cannabis prohibitions, we're usually talking about THC. Uh, I'm just going to talk about the federal law because I know that more. THC is its own federally controlled substance, but due to a number of lawsuits and, and developments, the DEA, Drug Enforcement Agency Administration, has recently taken the position that CBD is, or excuse me, THC is not a controlled substance to the extent it doesn't meet the federal definition of marijuana. The federal definition of marijuana is you would think it's just you know, the plant, right? It's not. Uh, it's the plant except for oils extracted therefrom, seeds, and mature stalks, which when people talk about industrial hemp, that's usually where it comes from, and that's usually where CBDs come from. So for example, Desiree Abbey, who you know, owns an Italy joint who put this together, her uh, shop sells, I mean her, her clinic sells CBD water, among other things. Yeah. It's yeah. clearly labeled that doesn't have THC in it. Yeah. Um, so CBD is not technically legal, but it, 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 it depends, is, is the kind of thing. Um, since most of industry or since most of CBD oil comes from hemp, it could be impacted by the federal farm bill this year, which would legalize industrial hemp overall to the extent it has less than 0.3% THC. So mm -hmm. the answer is yes, sort of. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. but, it's as that's clear what everybody as says. Yeah. But the, the, the practical reality is if you have CBD oil that you rub in your hands for your arthritis and like a cop sees you doing that, no one's going to. I guess one now, my, my legal advice as a lawyer is not to right. do that and right. not care about it. I'm going to look at from the end up, say, growing it. So, so growing hemp depends a lot on the state program. Like New Jersey, for example, has no process by which you can grow industrial hemp. South Carolina does. Like there are farms in South Carolina, they grow hemp outdoors. Uh, and it, I mean, it's a cannabis plant. I've heard Kentucky. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of states are moving state that way. State to state. Okay. Yeah, the, the 2014 Farm Bill, part of it allowed for state programs, to, or for states to come up with experimental and research programs growing hemp. There are states that took that pretty far and just said, we're just gonna have, you can grow hemp now. Okay. Um, but that, in the federal law, to the extent that there's any THC in it, it could still get you in trouble, but CBD on its own doesn't necessarily have any THC on it. Right. So if you get a little vial, you know, sometimes right. it'll say right. THC free right. or less than 0.3%, and that's why. Right. Okay. Can you clarify the definition of decriminalization? Does that mean you can have a small amount? Or? Uh, oh, we'll okay. get to that momentarily. <laughs> Hold that thought, please. Okay, so just looking at the overall impact of the criminalization of marijuana from a national perspective, there's one marijuana arrest in this country every 48 seconds. Let me just like let that wow. sit you for a second. Um, there's significant disparities, as we all know. Um, number of people arrested for marijuana law violation in 2017 is six, uh, 659,700. The amount of those people who were just charged with pure possession is basically 90%. So the majority of people arrested for, Good morning. Good morning. for marijuana 
possession, you know, arrested for marijuana, are charged with possession. They're not trafficking it. So that shows you the impact that full legalization would have on the country at large. Um, despite the number of states that have been legalizing marijuana and decriminalizing, arrests still went up by 1%. So again, it's showing that disparate impact and that disparate enforcement. Um, so we have so many people, like tens of thousands of people are just getting locked up daily for something that's legalized. You want to talk about, or I can talk about decriminalization? Okay, um, just going to give you guys a quick look at racial disparities. Um, there's no real difference in usage between white people and people of color, but there's definitely huge disparities in who gets arrested for it and it's people of color. 3.75 times more likely to be arrested for marijuana than white folks. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, you may. Yeah. Is this 219, maybe? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> On uh, past, you know, moving past legalization, or how legalization is not the end. Exactly. So to address your question earlier, um, there's three pathways really to legalization. There's decriminalization where marijuana basically becomes a civil infraction. So you get a fine or community service hour, something along those lines. Depenalization is where all penalties are removed, but it's still not legal. So it's sort of like this weird in-between, it's like a hybrid, right? Very few states are using it, but it's a pathway. And then there's full legalization, which is allows for growing it, uh, cultivating it, possessing it, selling it, all of that. And just as an example for those of you who live here in Philadelphia, the way decriminalization works in Philadelphia, oh. is city council passed a bill in 2014 that creates a civil penalty for marijuana use for a small amount of marijuana being under 30 grams. If you get caught possessing it, it's a $25 fine. If you get caught smoking it in public, it's a $100 fine. And that's it. And it, the, the bill instructs police officers you should give this civil fine and let the person go. Now, under state law, they still have the option to arrest you because it's still criminal under state law, but that's that's generally what decriminalization is, is we're going to give you a fine, like a parking ticket, and then let you on your way. We're not gonna put you behind bars. And then so another hybrid that falls sort of under decriminalization is using civil citation programs where basically uh, for instance, I'm from Florida. Um, the problem is we have <coughs> disparate application across the state, but that's a separate issue. But basically what would happen is if a, an officer encountered a person, realized they were in possession of marijuana, they would give them this citation and say, okay, you know, either pay this fee or do 25 community service hours, and then the case will be dropped against you. It's a way that you're not being arrested and not being funneled into the system. The problem with that <laughs> is that the folks in white communities tend to get the civil citations and the folks in black communities are still getting arrested. So one police department, the city of Miami police department, the chief told all of his, all his folks, all his officers, you have no longer have discretion. If you encounter someone and it's their first or second time in the system with regards to marijuana, in other words, they don't have a criminal history for marijuana, you must give them a civil citation. But, you know, the rest of the city kind of like, oh yeah, that's nice. Maybe we'll do that, and maybe we won't. So again, that, that is one of the reasons why you have that disparity in arrest between people of color and all right, so talking about what legalization can include, do you want to touch on some of the holistic aspects of you know, what, what a good bill looks like? Yeah, so I'll, I'll talk about a couple of the problems that exist in laws now to highlight some good things that exist in other places. So in Pennsylvania and New Jersey, as well as many other states, you can be prohibited from participating in the legal cannabis industry if you have a drug conviction or a conviction of any kind. Um, now there are exceptions. New Jersey accepts people who were convicted for possession of less than I believe 30 grams is generally the magic number. But Pennsylvania law, if you have a, a criminal drug conviction, you cannot be a financial backer of a cannabis organization. You cannot be an employee at a cannabis organization. You cannot be a volunteer at a cannabis organization. 
uh, which creates a cascading problem by this licensure. The people who are working in this industry before it became legal, who will be prohibited from working in it after, and it severely, um, you know, in, in the law, severely impacted black and brown communities, a lot more than white communities beforehand, and that's going to create the effects going forward. The good thing about the cannabis industry is since it is so new, and since it is basically being created by state governments, states can set restrictions on how it should operate and, and what it should look like. And a great example is in Massachusetts. Massachusetts has what's called their social equity program. Uh, they put $300,000 in the first year of their legal cannabis industry into basically contracting job training organizations, um, specifically and solely for people who either have had drug convictions, for family members of people who have had drug convictions, or people who come from uh, overly marginalized or impacted communities. It is specifically for those people to get them working in the cannabis industry and give them opportunities, and not just at, at different levels. They tier it in four different levels, so it's in everybody from uh, you know, the person greeting you when you walk into a dispensary to the person who's owning the dispensary. Uh, that's a state program that Massachusetts created and could be created in any other state as part of a medical marijuana program, as part of a state legal program, or something that can be added on top. And that's an opportunity that exists here that doesn't exist in a lot of other mature industries. So, yeah, so that's one good aspect, is making sure that impacted communities are fully integrated into the process as we move forward towards legalization. Also is to look at a restored justice program for folks under the age of 21. So what do we do when we have a juvenile who you know, is caught smoking marijuana? Um, there are some folks who want to see stiffer penalties for, for younger people because they want to use that as a deterrent. Um, one of the things that the ACLU is definitely pushing for nationwide is to make sure that it's more a restorative justice model and you're not levying, again, fines and fees on families that may not be able to afford it. You know, now you're creating another situation and basically criminalizing poverty on top of trying to criminalize usage. So that's why we encourage the use of restorative justice programs, again, community service hours and you know, classes, things like that. Um, also, another huge aspect is the sealing and, and or expunging of criminal records so that you are able to move forward with your life, able to get a job, able to uh, get housing because you don't have those convictions on your record. And again, allowing you the ability to be able to work in the industry, or any industry for that matter, because we all know a background check can, <laughs> can, can end your chances of a, of a job. Um, also, looking at releasing people who are currently incarcerated once marijuana has become legalized. So again, how is it fair for someone to sit there doing jail time or a prison sentence for something that is currently legal? So that's another aspect that we encourage uh, legislators to look at when they're putting together a legalization bill. Um, and that's specifically coming up now in New Jersey. I mean, if you've been reading the news, New Jersey's coming very close to creating a state legal recreational use program. Uh, one of the hang-ups is what to do, and it is coming from a lot of you know, generally more progressive legislators, is coming from what to do about people with past conviction, people who are currently incarcerated. If the state is saying that this should no longer be prohibited, that it was a bad idea that it was ever prohibited, how is it fair to keep people locked up or keep uh, you know, people in a system that they're just going to be prohibited from being involved in this industry. I always say, a lot of times I go to organizations, you know, go to meetings and stuff. It's like we're saying it's okay to sell pot now that white guys in suits do it. Also, so you know, getting into the business end, of it, um, looking at it, you know, I'm poor, as I mentioned before, and one of the prohibit prohibitions. It, into getting into the industry is the application fee is sixty thousand dollars. That's just to apply to get a license in the state of New York. But when you submit that application, 
you need to have an architectural plan to you know, explain where, you know, what your business is going to look like. You need to have a business plan. You need to ha show that you've got two years of money in the bank to be able to keep the business afloat. I mean, as all those things stack up, if you are coming from a perspective of, okay, I've got you know, 50 grand in my pocket, I want to start a business, it's already prohibitive in Florida. So one of the things we encourage legislators to look at is how can we make sure that minority business owners are incorporated into this process, that they also have a chance as well to take part to open businesses? Is it micro grants? Is it you know, giving a percentage back? Is it you know, giving some sort of training? What does that look like? Think about that and ask those questions as the legislation is being um, put together. And then also, as was touched on before by Tom, you know, making sure that folks with with convictions for marijuana can still work in the industry, right? Because they're the subject matter experts. <laughs> so wh why are you holding that against the person when this is something that could be beneficial for the industry? So th that's another aspect. And then lastly, <coughs> making sure that new tax dollars that are generated from the sale of cannabis go back to the impacted communities. And that can be in the form of you know, building schools or training programs, VOTEC, that sort of thing. Um, in Florida, $5 for every new uh, cannabis license that's issued in the state of Florida, uh, $5 of that goes to FAMU, which is a historically black uh, university. So, and that goes towards their program in, again, learning new techniques and, and sciences in developing cannabis and habits. So that is a great way to give back because now you're creating a pipeline of young people to, that know the industry and that are equipped to actually work in the industry. And, it's, and I mean, that's the, the, the basics of what we talk about when we're saying that legalization is not the end. If marijuana was federally legal tomorrow, we would be living with the impacts of the system that we built over the last 50, 60 years. So it's, it's dealing with who, who's been imprisoned in this and, and what licensure requirements are we creating that, whether it's intentional or not, have the effect of excluding communities that have been disproportionately impacted in the past. Um, if, if it's, you know, just, since you touched on the licensure fee in, uh, in Florida, it's, it's a $10,000 application fee for a grower processor license in Pennsylvania and $200,000 to hold a permit every year. Uh, and this is for organizations that are being created from scratch. Uh, so what, what ends up happening, um, what one statistic I'll put out is, I believe the, the number is in California, 75% of the permits are held by 25% of the companies. Uh, so we're, we're seeing an industry where what we could create is something that has social equity, that has impact for communities that have been incarcerated by prohibitions in the past, or what could create is what's happened in a lot of other industries is um, prohibition by licensure, exclusion by licensure, and concentration uh, at the top and exclusion at the bottom. So this is all about making sure that in every step of the process, you're prioritizing racial justice. So as we know, minority communities, communities of color, have been negatively impacted by the war on drugs, the failed war on drugs. We bore the brunt of that. So how do we fix it? So you have to make sure that communities are not being left out of the process, as we mentioned before. Um, also looking at uh, non-monetary and non-arrest penalties for marijuana-related violations. So for instance, uh, smoking marijuana in public. What would be the appropriate penalty for that? You know, you start to think about uh, you know making sure that if it's a fee, it's a ten dollar, twenty five dollar fee, not something like a five hundred dollar fee. That again, you're back to the whole criminalization of poverty. Um, talk, we talked about the licensure, making sure that we release people and expunge past offenses and invest in communities. Um, also, another aspect that I want to touch uh, <coughs> on was ban the box. So as we look at not only just cannabis. You know, folks with criminal histories are just unable to get jobs in this country, period, because of their criminal history. And how is someone supposed to reintegrate back into society 
if they can't get a job, if they can't put a roof over their head, if they can't feed their kids. So that's why ban the box legislation is something that needs to be discussed, not only just in the cannabis context, but as a greater context when we look at criminal justice reform. What ban the box does means you don't have to actually check the box that you have a criminal conviction on your job application. And it's only in the final stages when you've had the interview and, okay, we're about to you know, uh, extend an offer. Then it's like, okay, then you have the discussion about criminal history. But it at least allows the person to get in the door to present themselves and then you know, see if something works. That then makes the employer more likely, since they've now built a relationship of some sort, to extend an offer and give someone a chance. Rather than on a piece of paper, you see that box checked, you toss it to the side and pick up the next one. And to that end, when for people who do get employment, once you are employed, employers have struggled to figure out what to do with people who use marijuana, you use cannabis in state legal programs. If somebody you know, smokes pot at night, comes into work, isn't high anymore, but they have a random drug test and it turns up for THC, what do you do with that person? Are they fired under your program? Um, some states specifically prohibit that. They will protect people who use medical marijuana and who may fail a drug test and say that is not sufficient reason for you to fire that person. Um, you have to you know, show that they were high at work or something like that. But that's not in necessarily in every state, so it's perfectly legal in some places to use medical marijuana as certified for you by a doctor, go into work uh, completely over the influence, uh, not under the influence, and be fired because he failed a drug test. And that's an example of another law beyond legalization of, of uh, things we need to consider growing the industry. And also, I mean, there is still the safety aspect, so we're not trying to like throw the baby out the bathroom, right? So if you're operating heavy machinery, and you shouldn't be under the influence because if you're doing this, operating this machinery, you're putting people's lives at risk. Or, you know, like the example that was given yesterday, uh, your airline pilot, right? Do you, do you want to know if this person has the influence as they're flying the plane? Mm -hmm. Probably not. The same way you wouldn't have want them to have had four shots of, of Patron before they got in the cockpit. It's, it's the same difference. So safety is still an issue, but if you're in a situation where you're a receptionist, you know, or um, I don't know, you're, a, you're an accountant, it's not that lives are now at risk if you're on the move or even have remnants from the so. um, Also another aspect to be very cognizant of is police encounters. So just because marijuana is legal doesn't mean police officers can't use it as a pretext to still stop you or search you. The same way, let's say, if an officer smells alcohol in your breath and you're behind the wheel of the car, you know, that gives them the leeway to be able to go in and either search you and try to figure out, you know, are you under the influence, things like that. So we have to be very careful with how we're framing the statute so that law enforcement does now not still able to use that as a pretext to look for another reason to arrest someone and put them into the system. All right, so one example is California. So uh, looking at the whole restorative justice model after legalization. So in 2015, there were more than 6,000 Californians who were in state prison or jail for nonviolent offenses having to do with cannabis. That's either growing or distributing. The day after Proposition 64, which legalized marijuana in California passed, these inmates were allowed to apply for early release or parole based on the fact that you know, cannabis is now legal. The DA's office in San Francisco said, and they started doing, they started reviewing 3,000 past cannabis cases, and they were either going to review, dismiss them, seal them, and we're going all the way back to 1975. So they're looking at this very holistically and trying to see how they can right these past wrongs. Um, they're also looking to resentence many past felony marijuana convictions. So they did one bash for the misdemeanors, but now they're looking at felonies. So now you're, you're trafficking cases, you know, your you're, you're sale cases. 
So they're looking at that to see, well, can we resentence? Can we give the person a lower sentence? Can this person be released? So the inmate can actually apply, but also the district attorney's office on their own may just decide to help you out anyway. And that's also been the case in Pennsylvania, or in Philadelphia particularly. In 2010, the district attorney created a small amount of marijuana program where if you were arrested for simple possession with less than 30 grams of marijuana, uh, you were given at least the potential for a $200 fine and nine hours of community service. This year, the district attorney said if you were arrested with a small, marijuana, a small amount of marijuana, their position is that with 51 pending cases, they dismiss, and the assistant district attorneys have been instructed not to pursue marijuana uh, possession charges in the future, which shows the power of, of local officials that they can make that policy on their own. And this is in Pennsylvania, where possession outside of the medical marijuana program is still strictly illegal. So Canada, <laughs> our neighbors to the north got it right. They have legalized it nationwide, and that went into effect this week. I believe it was on Wednesday. And they're the second country to do so. You're <coughs> first. Believe it or not, like in the Netherlands, even though there's like all those coffee shops and all that, it's still not legal. It's just this weird hybrid where, okay, coffee shops can hold X amount behind the bar and they can sell X amount, but then if you actually go to buy the weight that you need, <laughs> you could get arrested. It's very strange, it makes no sense. But anyway, that's how they do it in the Netherlands. In Canada, that's not the case. So what they're doing right now is that they're fast tracking 50,000 prior possession convictions to get them through the system to see if they can seal and expunge and clear those records, right? And they also sent information out nationwide to make sure that everybody knows about the change, what it looks like, what the regulations are. Which again, keeping people informed is critical because then you know how to govern yourself accordingly. You're not trying to Google online and figure it out. You have the government telling you, look, this, this is what you can do, this is what you can't do, and here's how to get more information. So I think that's a great model someday <laughs> for us. All right, so kind of summing up ways that you can help and ways that you can have, because everybody in this room can have an impact. The number one way is to vote, plain and simple, right? Be educated on the criminal justice reform issues in your state, in your jurisdiction, right? and make sure that you understand how the candidates that are up for election feel about that. Go to town halls and ask them. They're running and hold them to it. And if they get in office and they're not doing acts that are in, you know, in, in favor of criminal justice reform, then you know what to do when the term's up. Right? So voting is huge because legislators and elected officials have to listen to their constituencies. Also, participate on lobby days. So again, it doesn't end on election day. They go up to the, the Capitol, they go up to DC, right? You still gotta hold them accountable. And you show up to their office, you know, probably make an appointment, but you know, show up to their office and be like, these are the things that I'm concerned about. I'm concerned about cannabis legalization in Pennsylvania. What are you doing towards that? Because again, they keep track of the issues that people keep bringing up repeatedly. And if it keeps coming up, then they know that there's a political appetite for it. If they don't know that, if they don't hear from people, they can still stand on the whole, I'm tough on crime, you know, mantra, because they're not hearing otherwise. Or the people that they're hearing from are the tough on crime people, right? So if you want other voices to be heard, you've got to raise your voice. So go to lobby days, participate that way. And, and sometimes you'll even have to travel. All of your legislators are in district at some point in time during the week. So you can find a day where they're located nearby and then go see them and bring these issues up to the forefront. Make sure to educate others on the need for reform. Everybody in here is an ambassador, okay? You've been to this conference, you've either been here hopefully for the full two days, you've learned a lot. Share that information with your friends, your neighbors, your family, so that they can also go out and spread the word and debunk some of these myths and understand how criminal justice reform affects each and every one of us, right? So make sure that you do that. Again, encourage your elected officials through raising your voice, and also 
fight for the use of civil citations in states and areas where legalization <laughs> hasn't come yet. So legalization may be a little bit down the path, but you can fight for civil citations, so that way people aren't going to jail behind cannabis. That's a step in the right direction. And of course, I gotta shout out the ACLU of Pennsylvania, so <laughs> make sure to join the ACLU of Pennsylvania. And with talking about political pressure, we have a fantastic opportunity to create change in Pennsylvania. We don't have legal recreational use in this state, but what we do have is a very strong momentum towards that. We have an aggressive medical marijuana program which was passed through a Republican state legislature, um, of which there are many members who still say marijuana is the gateway drug. Uh, and they'll, they'll, they'll tell it to you on the record, even people who voted for the medical marijuana program. We have champions in the Philadelphia area, including Senator Sharif Street, Senator Dale and Leach, and State Representative Jordan Harris, who've all been here. Uh, and most recently, the Pennsylvania State House, the Judiciary Committee, actually passed a bill, or passed a bill out of committee to decriminalize marijuana statewide that would turn it from a criminal offense for small possessions of marijuana, or for small amounts of marijuana, to a civil offense, to a ticket. And there wouldn't be any jail time, there wouldn't be any prosecution, there wouldn't be any arrest, there wouldn't be any suspension of a driver's license. That passed out of the Judiciary Committee um, 20 to 4. Most, the vast majority, all Democrats and the vast majority of Republicans voted for it. Now that's not law now because the session has adjourned and it didn't pass the full house, but that's huge momentum. And if people are hearing from their constituents that this is something that they want, that they want the criminal laws reform, that they want prohibitions ended, they will listen. And in Pennsylvania, we have a huge legislature. Uh, there are, every district represents 70,000 people. So your state, your state representative's office is probably within walking distance of where you live, if you live in the city. All right, so, questions. Oh, <laughs> hand shot right up. Yes. As um, New Jersey moves toward I mean, I, I was going to say, I don't think, I don't know that it necessarily does, but obviously you can speak better to the political climate than I can. I mean, just looking at Colorado, the states surrounding it haven't legalized. You know, I mean, Cal it's, it's, so it's just basically California, you know, you got the whole West Coast, so you've got the Oregon, Washington, and, and California, but then you have kind of Colorado kind of off to itself a little bit. So it, it's going to be an interesting dynamic in Pennsylvania. The top answer is yes, I think it will put a lot of pressure. I don't think on its own it will be enough, but what we're going to see is a state that has a legal recreational use program and Delaware might get there as well. Um, and we're gonna see that on our border and see up close and personal how that works. Uh, and it's going to create pressure 